Yes, so let's try to uh, continue on the string models. Uh, I'm not sure if I can actually use the, well, your left side of the screen. Can you actually see this? It's kind of, yeah. I'll try to use mostly this part then because the light is broken. <laughs> yeah, still broken. Okay, so we had the drill sling models. Um, this is the same uh, image that you had starting uh, starting uh, well, last lecture. So we have the drill string here modeled by springs in green and ma masses in red. So it's basically just strings and masses. And then the masses have different properties. Well, they have mass, and they also have a um, radius, a cross section. And we have said that they don't really have any he height in one of our assumptions. So uh, having this model, next we had the forces acting on each of the blocks. So well, I guess I have to use here then. So we had each of the blocks. And in general, there was four forces on them. You had the uh, spring force, see in green here. So you had one force from this spring, that's everything below it. So this is true for all except the last block. We had a force going up because of this string, or so the strings above it. And then we had the gravity, and we derived the viscous forces, which was this mysterious R to begin with. So this is kind of the model we had. Next, we did well, copious amounts of math. And we were able to get a matrix equation for a system, which was written as M Q, where Q is the displacement of each of these blocks. Then C plus K, Q. And then do you want me to repeat what all of these matrices were? I guess you have the notes from last time. And then the driving force F of T. So this one only works on the, uh, well, in our model, it works only on the first element. So back to this model again, it's the driving force of the system. So what is pushing it downwards? I suppose you could model that with a sinusoidal um, force. So next, by doing some uh, coordinate transfer, let's see if I can find the coordinate transfer again. Yes. So we said that this displacement vector Q equals Y plus inverse of big K G plus V vector. And we ended up with this coupled equation. K, Y, still, and driving force, F of T. So this is where we left off last time. So from this, we can see that, I mean, if there's nothing acting on the system, if, whoops, if this bit is zero, and it was still to begin with, then the system just stands there. So that's a good sign that our uh, equations actually work. But the problem here is that it's coupled. This equation is still coupled. So we're going to try to, well, uncouple it. First, we will introduce a new time scale. This is going to be a lot of. So I think in the note, they uh, denote this time scale tau 2 for some reason. I just started with tau. 
So this is CS over N, N here is the amount of blocks we modeled it with, and then a regular time T. This CS, that's the speed of sound in steel. Well, or the materi material you, your string is made of. But for this example, just assume it's the speed of sound in steel. And steel, like so. And then we have the spring constant, k. And this is a small k, yeah. Small k equals e a over l, where e is Young's modulus. A is the cross section. Well, the area of the cross section of your drill string. There we go. And L, well, that's the length. And the length is H. So this could be. It's a uh, transformation. So we are scaling time. We are scaling time. So this is like regular time. This is in seconds. This is uh, scaled time. It is basically just to get uh, nicer looking equations later. And well, more elegant math. So it's just a scaling factor. So see, this is just a number depending on, well, the speed of sound in steel and the amount of um, masses we use to model a string. And then this is time. So this is just a number, and this is regular time. So it's just a linear scaling. Um, yeah. So that was it. And we will also introduce something called, well, a, this is kind of the mean of the uh, geometric. So when going down, maybe you can use this spot here. So when going down, this drill string will change diameter going downwards. So we will define a geometric mean of the cross-sectional area of our drill string. So this is going to be, well, this thing. This is the cross section area again. Yeah, of the uh, drill string. So, this is the mean. So, we will introduce um, a i, which is the normalized mean. This thing. So this is the cross section for each of the, yeah, this is the cross section for each of the um, bits. So for all of these bits here, they have some kind of AI. The uh, geometric mean of this is this A hat, which is AI. and then the nth root of this. So this small ai becomes the uh, normalized, normalized, uh, well, geometrical section, the area we're looking at. Was that understandable? So these big a's, that's the uh, actual cross-sectional area of the drill string. This A here is called a geometrical mean. So we have then multiplied all of the cross-sectional areas for each of the sections. And then we take the nth root of this, where n is the amount of, well, disks or masses or blocks or whatever, or elements, we could call them, 
So when you just divide this by well, this a hat, then we get a mean of it. So how much is deviates from the mean? So up here, when it is wide, this will be over, well, above 1. And here will be less, because it's under the mean. Yeah. So by using this, we can again rewrite this equation. As plus, let me see, CS over Young's modulus, mean, my A2, and then we have to scale the driving force as well. This is H over Young's modulus F. So now we have, in essence, just taken all of the, well, almost, all of the physics out of this. So I'll define these. So these are matrices. This is something else. That's a cross-sectional area. So then we have to define these matrices. Uh, are you sure you, I can't use this part? It's too dark. Oh, that's going to be a lot of <laughs> note taking then. Um, yeah. Okay, also. So this A one is a is going to be a diagonal matrix. Having these A one. So I shouldn't have removed this. Um Again, you have all of these normalized means. A like so. So normalized cross section. This was just a nightmare. So it's supposed to stay a i equals well big a i over the uh, geometric mean. So this is the normalized cross section. This a one over here. This is a diagonal of all of them. So a one, a two, a three, all the way to a n, which makes it a n by n matrix, and then this a2 looks slightly different. This is going to be a1 plus a2 minus a2, a2, a2 plus a3, so 2 minus a three zero and then as a tri diagonal matrix it continues. So we get minus a n minus one a n minus one plus a n minus a n a n and And like so.
Yeah, so these are all A's, not twos. But again, this system is then coupled because, well, this is a tridiagonal system. So it's coupled, so we can do better. So we have to find a way. And now, well, this is too much. But what we can notice is, is that these matrices, A1 and A2, they are positive definite. And when they're positive definite, they're also symmetric. In most cases, some people define it differently, unfortunately. But it's positive definite and symmetric. We have a saying in Norwegian, it might be Smirkovesque, better on bacon. Um, but yeah, when a matrix is positive definite, then in most cases, it's also symmetric. But some people define it differently. Anyway, I'm going to write this up. A1 and A2. And I'm going to define what positive definites mean. Real matrices. And, oh well, plus symmetric. I mean, that they are symmetric kind of falls out from this definition, but that's details. Anyway, since they are positive definite matrices, that means that for every vector V, a, so there's going to be a transpose here. This is positive for all. These are arbitrary vectors for all Vs in R times 1, except the nil vector. So whichever uh, vector you throw at this matrix, you do this operation, and you get a, uh, so this is just a scalar. It's just going to be a scalar. So if these v's are n times 1, then this is 1 times n, this matrix, we know n times n, and this one is going to be well, n times 1. So, well, if you eliminate these two, then you get times n, because these two, and then you have this times something that's n times 1, these two are eliminated, and you get a 1 by 1 matrix, or scalar. So this is just a number. And this number is going to be positive when you have a positive definite matrix. And thus, as a uh, consequence of this, we can solve something called the generalized eigenvalue problem. No. This might be new. It was certainly new for me when I saw it. But this means that, well, can so they generalized. I can value. Problem, which is a one v equals lambda a two v. So, do you see the difference between this and the? Well, this is the generalized and the normal one. Then you don't have this a two here. 
then you just have a matrix. But this one will give us, we, uh, when we solve this, we can get a diagonal matrix uh, D of the eigenvalues, so these lambdas. Mm, I'm going to go over there again. This means that we can find T of the eigenvalues. Uh, and the matrix big lambda of the eigenvectors. Well, this is, well, yeah, it's a matrix. Big lambda of the eigenvectors. So if you remember this from linear algebra, you should be able to solve this. But we won't solve it explicitly here. Uh, I think in a note, instead of this big lambda, they use a big V. But they have the luxury of having uh, bold letters, and we don't. So I'm just changing the symbol. So I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be using this only, though they use a different symbol in the note. And yeah, this, as you can see, is not the general, no, the um, regular eigenvalue problem you've been solving in linear algebra earlier. But using this, we have this big lambda transposed A1, big lambda, it's the identity matrix. And if we use it on A2, T here, this is the same as the diagonal matrix here. And again, we have more transformations. So the next transformation, um, So, mm, let's do this correctly. Yes. Your y vector scaled by this eigenvector matrix. Big lambda x. So, this is the first thing we do. And then we multiply it by, I'm going to count it. So we do this, and then we multiply it by this, the transpose of it to the left of the equation. We should end up with the equation x double dot plus cs over e a 
lambda t c big lambda dot d x h e a lambda t and then f of tall. So still, this equation is coupled, but through, um, well, well, not trial and error, but through experiments, we see that well, I'm gonna, we can see how we can do something with this big C. we have that this big C is going to be just some kind of constant CD times A1 which means so if this is just a constant so no, yeah this one just a constant, so it's just a number, and if we insert this here, you see that then we can take this to the left outside here, and we will have big lambda transposed times a1 times big lambda here. And uh, if you take a look here, you see that this is just the identity matrix here, which is diagonal again. So then we have decoupled our system. None of the equation, well, matter on anything else because, well, this is just our vector of displacements. Well, they are transformed displacements, but they're still displacements. And this one times something diagonal, well, still diagonal. This one's still diagonal, and this one is just a vector, D. Uh, Yes, that's just a vector. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to solve this generalized eigenvalue problem that I had on the blackboard. <laughs> um, I won't go into solving it, fortunately. Yeah, it's a matrix. Yeah. So as you can see here, so this D here, this is all the eigenvalues you get on a diagonal, and this big lambda, this is all the eigen corresponding eigenvectors. Yeah, that's an eigen. Well, it's a collection of all the eigenvectors. So you're going to have, well, x amount of well, yeah, x amount of eigenvalues, and then all of the eigenvalues will have a corresponding eigenvector which you can organize inside this. So this is, well, kind of hand wavy because I'm not solving the generalized eigenvalue equation, but it is certainly possible to do. Uh, that is one of the most challenging parts of solving this problem though. So I'm kind of cheating by just skimming over it. But yeah. Mm, next, if we look back at the earlier or previous lecture, we see that we have a good approximation for this constant. And that is that CD is well this zeta one over A one is well an okay approximation. So as you can see here, this is a difficult problem to solve because it's coupled, but by applying physics and actually doing experiments, we see that it doesn't really matter that much, this, this bit, and that we can approximate it with this. 
true physics, and physics also says this. So then we basically have everything. So this is it's a bit of hairy math, all of these problems, but through both math and physical approximations, we can solve it. But yeah. I can't see what we end up with. So then we do all of the stuff total about and we end up with just Theta over n is apparently a good approximation here. Nope, not roll. See. Over n, so that is if you actually calculate this. Should hopefully get the same. D. Calls. H A Lambda T F of Tau, like so, where this is zeta, this two pi L mu C S over E. A1, A hat. So you see, in order to make sense of this, you have to backtrack a lot because you have to figure out what this was again, what this was again. Well, this is the length of our uh, real string. I forgot what it was actually, <laughs> sorry. Um, but it should stay in the notes. Logarithm of alpha one minus one, and then the inverse of this. Yeah, and then we have the solution or well, a solution. So we're not done doing transforms. So next I will introduce a new scaling of time, which is equals tall to Lee. And then I will let omega i be equal to n. This is then so d i i, that's the diagonal elements of the um um, well, the diagonal matrix of the diagonal matrix containing all of the eigenvalues. So these are basically the square root of the eigenvalues. And then mm -hmm, big lambda i. Well, this is the first value. Oh, for yeah, first element. So elt. Of ith vector. Does that make sense? So this is this is when you have the matrix um, like so, and then you would have all the eigen values down here, no eigen vectors, and then this one i is just well one one is this. 1, 2 is going to be this number, and so on. So this is just a number. Did we need anything more? Nope.
So by applying this, we can get this equation on component form, x i, which is the ith element, psi, yes, I did forget one. We also have x i, so x i i is c over two omega i. Yes. Here, this one. No, this is going to be not c, but theta. So the symbol i omega i x i dot x i hmm? oh no it's uh, just zeta it's just zeta and two again a one lambda one i and then big q which is the driving force and then and then this thing we can actually do something with so to get this right this is a second order differential equation so we can actually solve this using standard techniques that we've been through. Um, so we need to find a particular solution and a homogeneous solution. Well, actually, first a homogeneous and then a particular. So do you remember what a homogeneous solution to this is? Well, that's when this is there's zero driving force. Then we get the homogeneous solution. So we'll start looking at this. And that's the amount of uh, elements we have. So that's um, back to this model again. You have, well, this is block number M1, and then you have N of these blocks. So that's N, kind of like a scaling factor. Um, it is difficult to keep everything straight here, but it should make sense. Yes, anyway, homogeneous solution. So this is when q tau tilde equals zero. So this means that the right-hand side of this equation is zero. So, yeah, where linear combinations of this is zero, or the null space of it. And this is a uh, damped oscillator which, well, I think you can look this up in tables, but it's going to be a i exponential function of minus. So this a i is from the initial conditions. This is a different a i that we had earlier. <laughs> so this is not the cross section. This is not the cross section anymore. Um, now it's just the uh, constant. So that's why I had the tilde over the one over here. And then the big A was something else. It's, we need a bigger alphabet. Start using serial letters or something. See, I, omega I. Oftentimes this should be clear out from context, but sometimes, no, it's not. Sin. Minus xi squared. Omega i tall plus bi. And yes, this one 
also is from initial conditions. So, from ICs. And then we will slightly rewrite this. See? I. Oops. So the exponential function minus theta over two times tau tilde. And then we'll introduce more symbols omega d i tau tilde plus. Bi, where this one is the damped angular frequency. So omega d i is equal to the thing it's substituting. Oops. I, this thing squared, i. So the damped angular frequency. This is called, yes. So this is damped oscillations. Mm. If I can take a bit of this. So is this okay? So how does a damped oscillation look like? Well, so if you're just exciting it, just an instant, and then just let it rest, you will see that it will decay exponentially. So this decaying here. is controlled by this term. Oh, yeah, actually this term. So this is the decaying bit, or the dampening bit, and then this is the oscillation bit. So this is the, well, the sine wave. So we're pushing it, um, this is, well, because it's a phase, so it doesn't really matter. So then we have the first sense. So that means that we can add as many of these terms as we want, and that would just add up to zero. Because that's how the homogeneous solution works, because then we said that the right hand side is zero. So then we can have a linear combination of these solutions. Next. We need to find the particular solutions. And I think we should do that after the break. Uh, what happens if our side is bigger than one? If. Uh, which one? Let's see. So we have sine one minus sine uh, squared. Oh, this one. Um, yes. I don't think this can be bigger than one, looking at it. But then you would get um, either a uh, unstable system, or it would be damped. Uh, no, it has to be, for this to be physical, it has to be less than one, else, else it would explode else this will explode. Then you would have an exponential term 
that just shoots to infinity. So yes, for this to be physical, this one has to be less than one. The xi. Which in sure if we try to calculate it, it should be less than one also, unless you do something in physical. So yes, then we'll do the particular solution after a break.